Hey guys, Professor Gooden here to talk about substrate depletion and repletion. What happens when we use up all of the substrate during exercise and how do we get it back? Okay, as I mentioned, I'm Professor Jacob Gooden from Point Loma Nazarene University professor of kinesiology, and today we're going to talk about substrate depletion and repletion in exercise. Now this comes from chapter three of the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. The chapter is by Drs. Hera and Kramer. Okay, so we've been talking about the three different energy systems, the phosphagen system, the glycolytic system, which can be fast and anaerobic, or it can be slow and aerobic, and the oxidative phosphorylation system. Now these three energy systems all depend on certain substrates or substances in order to run. The phosphagen system depends on phosphagens or creatine phosphate. The glycolytic system depends on glucose or blood glycogen and the oxidative phosphorylation system, well that can use glucose or protein or fats. Now as far as the phosphagen system goes, creatine phosphate can decrease markedly up to 50 to 70 percent during the first stage of high intensity exercise and as a result of repeated bouts can be almost eliminated as a result of very intense exercise. So if you're doing something like hill sprints with very little rest or some sort of CrossFit wad that's asking you to continue doing interval after interval, you can really exhaust your creatine phosphate stores it actually takes quite a while to replenish ATP and creatine phosphate. So complete resynthesis of the ATP that you use during this very intense exercise, especially if it's a repeated bout, it takes up to three to five minutes. And complete resynthesis of your creatine phosphate, that takes up to a full eight minutes. So what this means for training is that if you're doing something like heavy weight training, which will decrease your ATP stores, and decrease markedly your creatine phosphate stores, you should be resting at least, at the very least, three minutes between heavy taxing sets. So if you're in the weight room and you're doing maybe sets of one to two to three power movements, like power snatch or power clean or, or very fast back squats, perhaps you don't need to rest for three minutes. But let's say that you're training closer to failure where the weight is moving slower because you're grinding it out and maybe it sets a five or eight or 10 or even 12 on say a back squat or a bench press, well you should probably be resting at least three minutes, maybe up to five, maybe even eight minutes if your true goal is to maximize the amount of energy and effort you can put into the subsequent set. Now we don't always have eight minutes to rest in between sets, but as far as substrate repletion goes, that would be the best for the creatine phosphate system. This is why you see um, power lifters resting for so long between their sets. Because for those athletes, specificity is just getting one repetition done with as much weight as they can. And to do that, they need a very, very, very rested and robust creatine phosphate and ATP system. So in between heavy sets, they want to rest as long as they can to put the maximal effort into the next set. If you're training college athletes, maybe they don't have that kind of time in the weight room. And so giving them at least three minutes will ensure that they're at least approaching the next set with some semblance of repleted ATP and creatine phosphate stores. Now for the glycogen system, the rate of glycogen depletion is related to exercise intensity. So you will deplete it much faster during say a 10K or a half marathon than something like an ultra endurance run or walk. Okay, so it's really related to the exercise intensity because there's a wide range of intensities that you can train at or perform at using the glycolytic system. Now at relative intensities above 60% of maximal oxygen uptake, muscle glycogen becomes increasingly important as far as energy goes. At the end of performances, the entire glycogen content of some muscle cells can become depleted. So not of the entire muscle, but of some muscle cells within the muscle, they can lose all of their glycogen during exercise. So how do we recover that glycogen? Well, we recover it during subsequent feeding and post-exercise carbohydrate ingestion. Carbohydrate ingestion is just a fancy way of saying 
eating and drinking carbs, right? So as soon as you are done exercising, as soon as you're done with a soccer match or a voluminous weight training session or a, an interval or endurance run, you want to begin repleting your muscle glycogen by consuming carbohydrates. It appears that somewhere between 0.7 to 3 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight ingested every two hours is optimal. Now that's a wide range, right? 0.7 to 3 grams per kilogram. So for somebody who's 80 to 85 kilograms, that's, you know, 160, 185 grams of carbohydrate every couple of hours. It seems like a lot, but if we are training hard and want to recover optimally and be ready to go, if we want to really top off our glycogen stores for the next bout of training, which might occur later that day, or it might occur the next day, depending on your training schedule, then we really, we really can't neglect the ingestion of these carbohydrates. Now, as far as fat goes, you are probably never going to run into a situation where you run out of fats to use because your body has such a huge store of fats. And because fat is used in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, you can get a ton of ATP for every free fatty acid that you oxidize. Okay, so you're not gonna run out of fats. Really, the concern is for your glucose and your muscle glycogen, as well as for the phosphagen system in your cells. So this table is showing the primary limiting factors for these various events, okay? So up here at the top, you have the marathon, and then down at the bottom, you have the discus, and then a repeated exercise, so repeated snatches at 60% of 1RM. And let's start at the top. So for the marathon, a long event taking somewhere, you know, between two hours all the way up to four or five hours, creatine phosphate is not going to limit you. Muscle glycogen will definitely limit you, okay? Liver glycogen will be a limiting factor. Fat stores, again, not so much, okay? You'll see, you won't see a five in fat stores for any of these events. Lower pH won't limit you because you're not exercising above your lactate threshold, so you're not going to see a decrease in your blood pH. As we move down the list, let's hop down to the 1500 meters. That was the event I used to run. So ATP and creatine phosphate, yeah, they might limit you a little bit. Uh, so if you don't have a well-developed creatine phosphate system, perhaps you'll be slowed down a little bit because there are some bursts of speed in the 1500, but it's not so bad. Really, it's going to be muscle glycogen. So will you ever have to stop in a 1500 meter race because you run out of glycogen? No, but if you haven't topped off your muscle glycogen, it could limit the speed at which you can perform that race. Fat stores, not a huge contributor. Lower pH, definitely a contributor. I would say maybe even, you know, maybe higher than a three because especially at the end of a 1500, uh, you can really go lactic as you tie up during that last 400 meters, kicking it into home. So I would say from experience, maybe higher than a three. Uh, that the authors of the textbook think maybe it's a two to three. Uh, if we go down though to a 400 meter run, now we're really talking about pH being the limiting factor because as you are really, really hammering that fast glycolysis system and you're generating pyruvate, which is then turned into lactate, your body cannot clear that lactate fast enough with the Cori cycle. It's just not built to handle those volumes of blood lactate. So you're going to blow right through your lactate threshold, hit onset of blood lactate, and then it's gonna go through the roof, such that at the last 50 or so meters, last 100 meters, if you're not well conditioned in that 400, um, it's, it's quite a sensation that you'll feel in your glutes and hamstrings when the pH really drops in those muscles. And so that's going to be the primary limiter. For something like repeated bouts of the snatch, where you're doing you know 60% of your 1RM, it's not too heavy. You can really move that bar fast. Maybe you're doing power snatches. It's really going to come down to ATP and creatine phosphate stores. Because remember, it takes up to eight minutes to replenish your creatine phosphate stores. So unless you're resting for a full eight minutes, then those 10 sets of singles in the snatch, each set you're going to start with less and less creatine phosphate so that by the seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th set, you're starting with way less creatine phosphate and relying, uh, starting to rely maybe on some of these other energy pathways to generate sufficient power to get that bar overhead. 
Okay, the next concept we need to talk about is excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, or EPOC, E-P-O-C. EPOC is the amount of oxygen during recovery that you require in order to replete your other energy systems. So in this example here, shown on the right, we have exercise that lasts for 15 minutes, and this exercise requires a certain steady state of oxygen delivery to the muscles. However, when you first start exercising, it takes the body a little while to really ramp up the oxygen delivery to the, des to the required levels. This triangle right here in the upper left, this is called the oxygen deficit. So when you're starting exercise, it just takes a little bit for your oxygen delivery to really sufficiently supply the muscles with oxygen. And therefore, you will have a deficit an amount of energy that you didn't supply aerobically and that will need to be supplied anaerobically to the muscles. After you're done exercising, we have the EPOC. This is the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption and this signifies that your body is recovering. Your breathing will still be elevated during this time, your heart rate will still be elevated, and your body will be using the oxidative system to drive repletion of the phosphagen system and of your glycolytic system to just restore the body back to homeostasis. This is why when you finish a hard effort, you don't immediately start breathing normally. You have a higher breathing rate, heart rate, blood flow rate, etc., for a while and it starts to drop off slowly because your body is utilizing a ton of extra oxygen. So technically the definition of EPOC is oxygen uptake above resting values that is used to restore the body to the pre-exercise condition. We also call this oxygen debt. Now if you are exercising above your maximal oxygen consumption or your VO2 max, then we have a much larger oxygen deficit during exercise. So here we see that this curve representing your body's oxygen uptake, it never fully reaches VO2 max. <clears throat> it never fully reaches VO2 max and the entire time the required energy supply is way up here. And so we are going to use anaerobic means to meet these energy requirements. So fast glycolysis, the phosphagen system will be using up our creatine phosphate, will be generating lactate during this time. And then when you finish exercising, the EPOC will be larger than if you were exercising aerobically. Another thing to note is that this exercise is only lasting one minute instead of 15 minutes. So what does this mean for our athletes or for our general population trainees or for us if we're trying to get into shape? Well, it means that if you really want to disturb homeostasis to incur high oxygen debts, then it might be better to do shorter, higher intensity intervals above your VO2 max instead of doing longer steady state exercise if your goal is to drive a conditioning effect for the glycolytic system and even for the oxidative system. Okay, thanks for going through depletion and repletion of substrates. In the next video, we are going to examine metabolic training specificity, or how do you design training programs to tax specific energy systems or to enhance specific energy systems. All right, if you guys had any questions from this video, let me know down below, and I'll see you all on the next video. Let me know, <clears throat> let me know, la, 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 la. let me know down below, and I'll see you all on the next video.